Hello! Thank you for joining us today. I'd like to thank the Stickney Forest View Public Library for hosting me today. Today we're going to be going over what you might need to be doing to get your bicycle running in better shape this summer. Hopefully you've had it out this spring and have been enjoying some lovely weather and some lovely trails, but you may have encountered some problems. Um, we're going to be going over what you need to do to make sure your bike is running properly and giving you lots of enjoyment this wonderful summer riding season. Thank you again. Today we're going to be discussing how to keep your bike rolling this summer. Hopefully you've been out enjoying some lovely spring weather, getting out on the trails and enjoying your bike this summer. But maybe you're starting to see some issues with it and we're going to go over that today. Now first of all, was your bike stored in a nice safe place all winter, um, up out of the way, well maintained, etc.? Or was it just tossed into the garage or basement last fall when the riding season ended? Well, let's start with a, a very neglected bike. Um, this bike has been seriously neglected, but take a couple minutes and look at this bike and see if you can spot all of the issues that it has. All right, let's go over those issues. First of all, it's got no reflectors. Um, huge safety issue. Daylight hours are much longer, but you get into shaded areas. You might be out at dusk. You really want your bike to be as highly visible as possible. Also, there's lots of dirt on this bike, lots of dirt and lots of corrosion. Lots of dirt and lots of corrosion. Also, these tires are very badly dry rot. You can see the cracks there and in the next slide. As I press down on this tire, you can see those cracks start to open up. This is very bad. Um, when tires are dry rotten like this, if you fill them up to full pressure, there's every possibility that they could start coming apart and fail while you're out riding and cause you all kinds of issues. So these tires definitely need to be replaced. So it's time to start taking things apart. Now this is a coaster brake bike. Um, I'm sure everyone has ridden a bike like this as an adult or as a kid. Basically you turn the cranks backwards to apply the brakes to slow and stop the bicycle. First we disconnect the coaster brake arm. and then taking that rear wheel off. Now, if you look closely at this nut, you can see it's deformed. That's from using an improper wrench to remove or tighten this nut. You always wanna make sure that any wrenches, any tools you use, screwdrivers or wrenches or Allens, anything, fits the fastener properly. If you use a wrench that's a little too big, you're gonna end up with this kind of issue happening. If you use an adjustable wrench and you don't keep the jaws very tight on that fastener, you're gonna end up with issues like this. So it's always best to use the exact right size wrench. Now, if you're removing the chain, you're gonna to wanna to find the master link. There are many different styles of master link. Some just have a little snap ring that goes around them. You pry apart that snap ring and the master link comes right apart. Some are like this where it has to be pressed apart. Um, sometimes you're going to look at a chain and you're going to see no discernible difference in any link along the chain. If you can't find anything that looks different, that chain is going to come apart exactly like this one did. And you can pick any link to take apart. Now this tool, um, the Master Link Press, it's available at a toolkit that I was able to check out from my local library. Um, 
many libraries are starting to have different tools and stuff that you can check out. Um, so check with your local library and see if they have toolkits for working on your bicycle. Here's a closer look at that master link press. It's very handy for removing those, those master links. Now, if you're removing or if you've got a new bicycle, you're installing the pedals after you've taken it out of the box. On the left hand side of the bicycle, the threads on those pedals and, and all of the fasteners that hold the crank in place are left handed threads. What that means, standard fasteners, there, there's the old rule, righty tighty, lefty loosey. So you turn it right to tighten it and left to loosen it. When you encounter left-handed threads, it's the reverse of that. You turn it left to tighten it and right to loosen it. And they do that on the cranks on bicycles so that as you're applying torque, pedaling the bicycle, those, those fasteners do not come loose. Now these are the crank bearings on this bicycle. The grease on these bearings had solidified and become very sticky. So in, instead of lubricating, it was kind of holding them in place. But the bearings themselves were actually in fairly decent shape. So basically all these bearings are gonna need is a really good cleaning and then to be re-lubricated and all of the, the races and cups that they ride in need to be cleaned as well. But these bearings are actually going to work just fine for many more years. Now I'm going to be removing the handlebars and neck on this bicycle. The first step is to loosen that neck bolt that runs down through the stem of the neck into the fork of the bicycle. You don't need to loosen it a whole lot, maybe about three eighths of an inch. Then the next step you give it a little tap with a hammer. And now it's loose. You can see the neck has actually, actually dropped down into that fork tube. And this is what I was loosening up there. This is called a stem expander bolt. And every bicycle neck that I've removed um, in all the years I've been playing around with bicycles has had something very similar to this to hold the neck in place. Basically, it's two angled surfaces that as you tighten it up, they wedge together and expand against the inner diameter of the fork tube and hold that neck in place. Now, I could have removed that big long bolt completely and these two wedge pieces would still be stuck together. I would still have a hard time getting that neck out. That's why I had to give that, that bolt a little tap to get this piece loosened up. Now these are the headset bearings. They're the bearings that the front fork rotate on. And just like those crank bearings, the grease had become sticky and solidified and dirty. And all of that old grease needed to be cleaned off and re-lubricated when it was reinstalled. Now your bike, and unless you've left it out for years, is probably not gonna be in this state of disrepair. But this bike was in sad shape. These are the front axle bearings, for instance, and just like those other bearings, the, the grease had become so sticky, the front wheel would barely turn. Um, fortunately, these are caged bearings. They're super easy to remove and to clean and reinstall. This is the front hub on this bicycle and the hubs on this bicycle, as well as those wheel bearings, um, need to clean out any of the old dirt, sticky grease, and, and clean these hubs up as much as possible so that the wheel spins freely. Now I'm removing those old dry rotted tires. Whatever you do, do not use a metal screwdriver to remove your tires or to reinstall your tires. You will scratch up your rims, um, You and most often you will pinch the inner tube and damage that inner tube. Now 
Now these are the wheels on this bicycle. The one in front hasn't been cleaned yet. The one in the back has been cleaned. You can see it looks really nice. The um, product I use to clean these wheels is called quadruple zero steel wool. Now that's four zeros. If you go to clean rust off of chrome ever, this is the, the best product I've ever found. Several restoration guys um, I know use the same stuff too. It's very fine steel wool. If you use something like a Brillo pad or standard coarse steel wool, you will scratch up the chrome and actually dull the chrome. You, you won't polish it. So quadruple steel wool is available at most hardware stores and home centers. But if you're going to do this, double, triple, quadruple check and make sure it has four zeros. Now these are the, the bearings and the bearing cups and the races that hold those bearings together. Everything's been cleaned up, removed all of that old nasty grease. And you can see I've got a chunk of quadruple zero steel wool that I've used to polish any imperfections, pits, or corrosion from those bearing cups and races. Now here I am reinstalling the bearing cups on this bicycle. These bearing cups are a, a mild press fit. Um, basically just the cups are slightly, slightly bigger than the diameter they fit in, but not much. So you don't need to really pound on these. You don't need an arbor press to um, remove or install them. Removing them, I took a, an old large flat bladed screwdriver and tapped them out from the opposite side that you're, I'm showing in this photo. They came out real easy and they go back in really easy. But the main thing you want to do is not hit them directly with your ball peen hammer. Just grab a couple old chunks of wood, set the frame down on a piece of wood, and then use another piece of wood to tap the bearing cups back in place. Doesn't take very much at all. But you don't want to hit them directly with that hammer because you will ding and dent them, possibly deform them, and then you'll be trying to find new bearing cups. I'm reinstalling the headset bearings on this bicycle. They're those bearings that I mentioned before that the front fork rotates on. Um, everything's all nice and cleaned up and it's re-greased. Um, simple red axle grease that I purchased at my local hardware store. Same thing on the cranks. Plain old red grease from the hardware store works just fine. You don't need to buy any special um, grease for these, nothing really expensive. Um, those tubes or tubs of red axle grease that you can buy at your local hardware store fairly inexpensively, they work great. Also, you can see that I've polished all of this chrome up with my quadruple zero steel wool, so it looks good. Here I am reinstalling the cranks and bearings. This type of crank is called a one-piece crank. That's because the cranks uh, left and right are one piece. Most modern bicycles that you encounter are going to have what they call three-piece cranks. And you do need a special puller to remove those cranks. Um, the kit, which is actually in the background of this photo, that little gray box that I checked out from my local library, actually had a puller in it for removing three-piece cranks. If your local library doesn't have tools available for working on bicycles, you can buy those pullers fairly inexpensively at your local bike shop. If you're going to be working on your bike, you want to make sure you have the proper tools for working on your bicycle. So head down to your bike shop and, and get the right tools if you have those three-piece cranks on your bicycle. Now I'm installing new tires that I purchased for this bicycle, but believe it or not, as old as this bicycle is, um, the inner tubes still held air just fine. There was nothing wrong with them. A lot of what damages rubber is sunlight and exposure to air. And the tubes, of course, never were exposed to sunlight. There were no punctures in them, held air just fine. 
So it was a really good thing that I was extra careful removing the old tires because I was able to reuse the old inner tubes. Now, once again, do not use a screwdriver to install the bead of your tire. When you get to, you know, the first side of the tire goes on real easy, then you can start pushing the tire on, you know, after you've put your inner tube in there, you can um, start pushing the second side of the bead on, you'll get it about three quarters of the way on and it'll start getting really hard. You may be tempted to grab a flat tip screwdriver and pry it the rest of the way on. I can almost guarantee you, you will pinch your inner tube and destroy it. You don't wanna do that. These little plastic levers are a fantastic tool and you can pick up a set of them for just a few dollars at your local bike shop and they are well worth the investment. Now on this old bicycle, I on the front fork here, I thought this was a clever safety feature. Instead of just having a regular flat washer on the fasteners on the front wheel, it has this little washer that has a tab on it that fits into a hole on the front fork. And what this does, if those nuts on the front axle come loose, this will prevent the front wheel from actually falling right off of the fork. And I point this out because you want to be careful when you're disassembling and reassembling a bicycle to make sure every safety feature is reinstalled properly. I could have accidentally rotated this washer 180 degrees and it would have defeated the purpose of this safety feature. So watch out when you're removing parts on your bicycle and make sure they're installed the correct way when you reinstall those parts. Now it looks like I'm all done here, but can you see what I forgot? Take a quick look. I forgot the chain guard. I had set it off to the side and forgot to put it back on. But here's the bike, all reassembled, everything's cleaned up, everything's lubricated. I have purchased new reflectors front and back, and those great big reflectors for the wheel. This bike is gonna be highly visible when a car's headlights hit it, or any light hits it. So everything is ready to roll on this bicycle. When you do a project like this, or when you take your bicycle out for the first time, you want to go over and check every single fastener on that bicycle. You want to make sure everything is tight, nothing's come loose. Just grab your wrenches. It's a good time to make sure you have the proper size wrench for every fastener on your bicycle, and make sure everything is nice and snug on that bike. You need to check the tire pressure. The recommended tire pressure is going to be embossed on the side of every single tire. Now, it might say 40 pounds, it might say 60 pounds, it might say more. You don't necessarily have to fill it up right to that pressure. If you're going to be taking a bicycle, a mountain bike on dirt pass, you may want a little less pressure in there. But whatever pressure is, is embossed on the side of that tire, that's the maximum you want to fill that tire up to. Here's a couple examples. Now on this white wall tire, you can see very clearly that it says inflate to 40 PSI. On the gum wall tire on the other side, it's a little harder to see that that says inflate to 75 PSI. But there's an, an incredible difference in what tires may or may not need to be inflated to. Um, obviously, I would not want to fill that white wall tire up to 75. And if I only filled the gum wall tire up to 40 PSI, it would not perform up to expectations. So you need to find the recommended tire pressure. And you definitely can be a little bit under that, maybe 5 PSI. But you, you absolutely do not want to go over the recommended pressure on your tire. Now, I highly recommend that you purchase a good quality bicycle pump. Um, 
I've seen with my own eyes people explode bicycle tires using a standard air compressor to fill them up. If you have an air compressor that's capable of putting out 120 PSI at a high volume, you, you can very quickly overinflate a bicycle tire and, and blow it up. And you definitely don't want to do that. Um, a bicycle pump like this, it's got a pressure gauge built right in it. You're not going to overinflate your tires. Um, uh, it, this bicycle pump in particular, I bought at a local bike shop 20 years ago, and it has been functioning excellent for me for a couple of decades. Now, as far as tools, <clears throat> I highly recommend you get a standard and metric socket set. You want to make sure you have both. Often you find that bicycles have a combination of standard and metric size fasteners on there. Um, different components of the bicycle may have been made in different countries. So you, you, you often run into a variety of sizes, both standard and metric. Um, I've got a very, very high quality SK um, adjustable wrench in there. Um, if you're gonna use an adjustable wrench, you wanna make sure that it's, it's very well made, that it, the jaws do not wobble and that it has no dings or dent and, and that you can actually get it to fit snugly on your fasteners. Also, I have a set of standard and metric um, box wrenches there. Um, those come in quite handy for working on a bicycle. Um, if at all possible, I always recommend getting an extra 10 millimeter socket and wrench. Um, it's kind of a running joke with mechanics. You always seem to lose your 10 millimeter wrench and everybody needs a 10 millimeter wrench. It's the most common size fastener in the world, it appears. Um, even on Harley Davidson's, there's a 10 millimeter um, fastener on those bikes. I believe it's a part, a, a component of the ignition that's made in Canada that has a 10 millimeter wrench. Um, I have a buddy who's a lifelong Harley mechanic and, and he has to have a 10 millimeter wrench inside his box. And, and it is often getting borrowed or misplaced. So if you can, grab an extra 10 millimeter. Screwdrivers. Um, you're gonna need a couple different flat tip and Phillips head screwdrivers. On the right there, I have one of my favorite tools for, for working on many different things, but especially bicycles. It's a quarter inch socket set that I picked up at a hardware store years and years ago, but it has an adapter and many different size screwdriver bits. Um, that thing is great for getting into weird little angles. Um, and it's also wonderful for removing very stubborn uh, fasteners. And it is just a very handy tool to have around. Standard and metric Allen wrenches. Um, I have a couple um, sets here. These are ball end um, Allen wrenches. They're very handy for getting a screw started or getting into a weird angle. Um, but you definitely want to buy a high quality set of standard and metric Allen wrenches, especially for modern bicycles. Obviously on that old bike that I was working on in this video, there were no Allen wrenches, um, Allen key socket fasteners on that bicycle. But on most modern bicycles, you're going to counter, encounter at least some Allen wrench fasteners that you're, you're going to need this type of tool to remove um, and replace. These Allen wrenches, I, you can see they're, they're, they're a little old. There's a little bit of corrosion on them. Um, bought them years and years and years ago, and they hold up just fine. Um, so make sure you buy yourself a high quality set of these when you, when you go out and buy a set. Um, this is that toolkit that was available at my library. It's got a set of those tools for removing and reinstalling tires. Um, there's a chain wrench for grabbing sprockets, uh, that pin press for removing the master link on your, your chain. Um, all kinds of specialty tools that you may need for working on a bicycle. 
if your local library doesn't have a kit like this that you can check out, um, swing by your bike shop and pick up any specialty tools that you need for your bicycle. Now, WD-40. WD-40 is, is a great product for cleaning scratchy pots on old guitars. Uh, not kidding about that. Um, a, a luthier told me a long time ago when I had a guitar, when I turned the, the volume and tone knobs on it, it was making all kinds of scratchy noises. He said, oh, just squirt a tiny little bit of WD-40 in there and it'll clean it right up. And it does. It works really well for getting corrosion off of things, but it's not a very good lubricant. I do not recommend that you use it on your bicycle. Now, these are the products that I used working on the bicycle in the video. I used a can of gunk degreaser that I had picked up from an auto parts store to get all of that old grease and gunk off of the bearings. Um, you stand just regular 409 for cleaning off some of the heavy dirt and for lubrication I used um, a specific chain and cable lube um, this stuff works great for lubricating your your brake cables your derailleur cables um, and your chain if you need a penetrating oil for getting rusty parts apart I highly recommend PB Blaster. It is a fantastic product for eating away corrosion and getting rusty uh, bolts apart. Um, also a big box of shop rags for getting all the dirt off of it. And you'll see I've got a, a container of Carnuba car wax in there. And yes, I do wax my bicycles. It really helps protect them. Now, what are the minimums that you should do before taking your bike out? And you should have done this this spring, but um, we're going to assume that you haven't. Uh, you, you just took your bike out and started riding it. I'm going to um, start that over again because I need to redo this slide. Okay, so what are the minimums that you should do to make sure that your bike is safe and reliable for riding this summer? Well, you need to check for tire and brake wear, any loose or missing parts, any corrosion, wheel trueness, now, basically what this means is that when you spin the wheel, it does not wobble back and forth. If it does wobble back and forth, that is something that normally can be repaired. Um, highly recommend that you just remove the wheel and take it into your bike shop where they have a truing stand. Um, it's much easier to true a wheel on a truing stand than trying to do it um, by guess and by golly on the bicycle. Um, it is possible. Uh, but I, I wouldn't recommend it. it. It can drive you right up the wall if you start getting it wrong. And then, of course, just plain cleanliness. You should clean and wax all painted and chrome parts on your bicycle. You need to lubricate the chain and all the cables on your bicycle. And you need to check that tire pressure. Now this bicycle is much more like what you probably have at home. And it's much more in the condition that you're probably gonna encounter at home. This bike looks fine. Looks like you can just jump on it and ride away. Its reflectors are in place. It's got reflectors on the front and rear wheels. Uh, the reflectors on the pedal are intact and in good condition. The front um, and rear reflectors on the fork and on the seat post are installed and in good condition. But wait a minute, let's take a closer look at this bicycle. 
that frayed cable, if that pokes you in the leg, you are going to know it because it's going to like feel like getting stabbed with several needles at once. And also that cable is going to continue to unravel and it's eventually going to fail. Also, believe it or not, cat hair just is not a good chain lubricant. So, first of all, gonna wash the bike. I just use standard car washing soap, um, a couple of rags, and a scrub brush. And I, just with car washing soap and water, scrubbed the chain, uh, the sprockets, the derailleur, and every bit of this bike. I also installed a new ferrule on the end of that cable. Then I took my degreaser and degreased and then lubricated the derailleurs, the chain, um, lubricated all of those cables, and then checked the tire pressure. That's pretty much all this bike needed. Now, whether you've got an old bike like I, I showed you in that demonstration that I tore down and rebuilt, um, whether you've got a cruiser bike, a mountain bike, or something like that recumbent bike. Make sure everything is clean, properly tightened, and well lubricated. But get out there and have fun. Have all the fun. Visit your local library. If it's safe to get there and there's a proper bike path to your local library, um, I wanted to show this. My, my local library um, and is right along the Rock Island Trail. And several years ago, they applied for uh, grants. And all of the libraries, and there are several along the Rock Island Trail here, installed these repair stations. And it's a great place to stop, visit your library. And if there are any issues with your bike, they have tools. Um, and a bicycle pump if you need to add pressure to your, your tires. Um, but it's just a wonderful little thing, at least in my area. And check around um, in your area, too, to see if something like this is available at your local library. Thank you for joining us today. I'd like to thank the Stickney Forest View Public Library for hosting me today. I hope you found this presentation informative and educational and hopefully a bit entertaining. Now grab your helmet and get out there and enjoy this riding season. Thank you very much. One question I get asked a lot is, do you actually use WD-40 on old guitars? And yes, I do. As a matter of fact, this is a Gibson Melody Maker. This is 57 years old, and the pots were scratchy and making all kinds of noise, and WD-40 worked great to get this so it sounded good again. Now, I mention that not just because I think it's kind of humorous and entertaining, but knowing your products, knowing what they do, what they do well, and what they do poorly is very important. Make sure you know, um, for instance, WD-40, one of the reasons I really like using that is I know it won't damage a finish on an old guitar. If I get it on a table or on the floor, it's slippery, but it's easy to clean up. So know your products before you use them. Know what they're good for, what they're bad for, um, their pros and cons, basically. Make sure you understand each product that you're going to use before you go and use it. The next couple questions I'd like to go over are fairly subjective with the answer. 
Um, there's a, there's a lot of things that you'd have to consider to answer these questions. The first question is, how do you determine the size for a bicycle? Well, um, if you've bought shoes or clothes for kids, you know that they grow awfully fast. So you need to make sure that there's enough adjustment that you can raise the seat, move the handlebars to make the, the bike rideable for the kid for, for more than one season, if that's your concern. If, um, if you're just going to use a bike for one season, then, then that's not so much of a concern. But a, a basic rule of thumb is the, the top bar of the bicycle, the, the bar that you need to throw your leg over, can be no more than the inseam of your pants. So if you wear a 32-inch length in Levi's, make sure that that top bar is, is below that so that it's – and also – for some people, that may be difficult to throw your leg over something that high. You may want something lower. A lot of newer bikes have a very slanted top bar. They're not like this old bike with a, where they had the very straight top bar, and then the girl's bike had the curved bar where you didn't have to, to raise your leg up because you don't want to be unladylike. Um, anyway, um, so it, it's very subjective. If you, you've got a bad knee and you can't throw your leg up over um, – a bar, then you want to make sure that that top bar is much lower. Um, but the seat needs to be adjustable enough that you can get to a comfortable riding position. Now, what's a comfortable riding position? Once again, that can be very subjective. Um, uh, the, the road bikes with those curved handlebars, um, the guys lean way over to, to ride those things. Um, if that's a comfortable riding position for you where you're leaned over the, the bars, that's fine. Some people that may cause stiffness in their back and they don't want to ride that way. You may want bars that, um, handlebars and a seat set so that you sit more in an upright position, kind of like how you would sit in a regular straight back chair. So these are the kind of things it's, it's, it's hard to have a set hard and fast rule for what's the proper size for a bike. Um, you know, as a parent, you have to determine what size bike you're going to buy for your kid. And that's all about the height. And of course, kids, you know, they don't have a stiff knee or, you know, a bad back. So they don't need to worry about that as much. But you want to make sure that the bike is not too big for the kid. Um, general rule, you want to make sure you can put your feet on the ground. Um, if you feel comfortable only with your feet flat on the ground, then you need to make sure you can put your feet flat on the ground. Me personally, I just need to be able to put my toes on the ground, and that's that's good enough for me. Um, but when you're buying a bike, make sure that there's enough to adjustment so that you can change that. If, you've, if you're looking at a bike and the seat is all the way down and you can barely touch or it doesn't, you know, it's like, oh, I'm not sure this, you know, I could probably, maybe you want to skip that bike and get something with a frame that's a little bit lower. Um, once it's low enough, of course, you can adjust the seat higher and that's no problem. Um, you also want to make sure that the handlebars can be adjusted, um, whether you're turning the handlebars or raising and lowering the, the neck, that stem expander bolt that I showed earlier in the lecture. Um, you can raise and lower that a few inches too, but you want to make sure that it, it's comfortable for you. Um, that general rule where if you're sitting on the seat, you can put your feet flat on the ground or a bare minimum, you know, your, the balls of your feet firmly on the ground. Um, that's going to be necessary for you to, to ride the bike safely. I, I try to encourage people to, you know, if, if you don't want to go out and spend a bunch of money on a new bike, look around for used bikes. You can find, basically, often you can find people just giving a bike away. Um, but it may have some issues that need to be taken care of. Um, but the first thing you want to look for if you're, if you're purchasing a used bike is the same things. It, can I make the adjustments on this bike so that it's comfortable and safe for me or my kid or my wife or my husband to ride? Um, so you want to make sure that it falls into what your sweet spot is, where you feel comfortable riding. If you feel comfortable riding, leaned over the bars, um, in that racing position, cool. If you need to sit up in a more upright 
um, seated position, you need to make sure that that bike is adjustable to that riding position. And also the, the main thing is make sure it's not too high. If the bike is too high, uh, you're, you're probably going to topple over getting on or off of that bike. Um, now other things to look for in buying a used bike. Unfortunately, once again, no hard and fast rule but you just want to make sure any problems that bike has are they problems you can solve easily if it just is completely corroded and you're you're just like wow this thing looks like garbage maybe it is garbage um me personally i've taken rusty frames that were literally buried in a barnyard and repaired those but that's probably not what you guys are going to want to do you want something that you can clean up, put air on the tires, maybe change a few parts and be on your way. So check those things. It's just like the things you'd check for on your bicycle before you, you take it out. Make sure the tires are in decent shape. If they're not in decent shape, maybe that's something you're okay with replacing. No big deal. Um, the wear parts, if they're worn, you, you just need to replace them. Look for any kind of cracks. If you see cracks in the paint, there may be cracks in the welds. Um, anywhere the two pipes on that frame meet, look there and look for cracked paint. And if you see cracked paint, it's very possible that there's a crack in that frame. So maybe skip that one. So if you're buying a bike for a kid, honestly, make sure it's something the kid's going to think is cool so that they're like happy about riding it. And, and make sure that all the parts are there. Any parts that look sketchy, you know you can replace straight away. Um, and make sure it fits in that size range. Um, now, basically, rule of thumb, that in, inseam measurement um, that you have on your jeans, make sure the top bar is below that so that you can get your leg over that bar. Um, I've worked on a lot of antique bicycles, so I, I've taken, like I said, I've taken things that were pretty trashed and, and restored them. That's probably not what you guys are going to want to do, so use your own judgment. Be aware of what your skill level is, what your budget is for a bicycle, and try not to go over that. Uh, if, if somebody's giving something away, sometimes it's worth every penny of that free um, so just be aware and be careful and don't get yourself involved in something that's going to cost you more than you're really wanting to spend um, another question that's kind of associated with looking at used bicycles um, and looking at your own bicycle how much dry rot that cracking on the sidewall is acceptable well the answer to that is pretty much none um, if there's any cracking on the sidewall of your tire, it, it's, it's not going to get better, obviously, and it's only going to get worse. So if you see any cracks starting to develop on your tire, if it's towards the end of the season, maybe you can get away with not replacing that tire. I wouldn't recommend that. Um, as soon as you start seeing cracks on the sidewall, you should just head to the bike shop, buy a new tire, um, buy a set of those tire removal tools if you're doing it yourself and, and just swap out the tire it's it's not that expensive um depending on the bicycle some bike tires are you know are expensive some um are are less just depends you know there's a wide variety of bicycles out there another question i get is what are some common mistakes that a beginner makes working on a bicycle. Well, first and foremost, it's using the wrong size wrench. It's very important that when you're working on, on anything, any um, mechanical device whatsoever, that you use the proper size tool. If you are removing a Phillips head screw and you use a small screwdriver, a small Phillips head to remove a large Phillips head screw, you're going to damage that screw and it's going to make things more difficult. It's going to um, possibly strip out that screw and cause you all kinds of problems. You want to make sure that whatever tool you're using actually fits the fastener very snugly, that it's the proper size. Um, here, here's some pictures of various fasteners um, 
a couple various fasteners that um, I'm showing with the wrong size wrench and the right size wrench. You can see here, I've got a metric wrench on a standard size uh, hex head bolt. And I might be able to get away with turning this fastener if it's not too tight, but it's going to round the, the corners of this bolt a little bit, even if, even if it seems successful. And then when you go to work on it again, it, it could strip. Now, here's a picture of same fastener with the correct size wrench. And this is very important. You, every old bicycle I've seen has often several fasteners where you can see somebody has taken an adjustable wrench or the wrong size wrench and tightened or loosened the, the fasteners and they're rounded off. And sometimes with bicycles, they, they have, you know, especially the axles have oddball size threads and it's hard to find nuts. You can't find them at your hardware store. You have to go to a bike shop. Um, so make sure that your wrenches fit properly. Here's um, an Allen wrench. Sometimes these are a little harder to tell, but if you look at this one, I've got a, this is a quarter inch socket. That, that's what this fastener needs. And I've got a metric wrench in here and it seems to fit okay, but if you look closely, it doesn't fit quite right. And when I turn this, and I, I don't have a video of this, this is just a still photograph, but when I turn this, I can feel it wobble back and forth. Now here's the same fastener with a correct quarter inch Allen head, and it fits nice and snug. Um, very important that you use the right size wrench. Um, if you don't have the right size wrench, if you're going to use adjustables, uh, especially if you're having a hard time removing a fastener, don't just run and grab a great big wrench. Um, it, it, it can cause you all kinds of problems. I've got a few sizes of, of adjustable wrenches here. If you're going to use an adjustable wrench, really check and make sure that there is very little or no wobble, especially up and down on that movable jaw on that adjustable wrench. And each turn of that wrench, make sure you're paying attention and that uh, that thumb wheel hasn't come loose and you aren't rounding off that fastener. It's very easy, it's very easy to destroy fasteners with an adjustable wrench. Another common mistake, and th this is a lot on new bicycles. Um, mom and dad go out and buy the kid a, a bicycle, uh, picking it up at a department store or ordering it online. It comes in a box. And normally when they pack a bicycle in a box, of course, the handlebars aren't installed. It fits in a box smaller. Well, one of the things they also do is spin the front fork around backwards and that makes the bicycle take up a little bit less room, maybe an inch or two in the box. Well, you pull the bike out, that fork is reversed, and they just pop the handlebars on there. Now, here's a kid's bike, and you can see the front fork is straight. Doesn't look like it would matter much which way you put this fork on, but look at how the handbrake grabs the wheel. That should always be on the outside of the fork, not on the inside. It's possible it, there are so many different designs. It's possible it could work fine forever, but it's also possible that something could get jammed up. Um, the, the cable for that brake could bind. Now also, look at this one. This, this little kid's bike has disc brakes, but you can see the front fork pushes outward. And it, it's the little um, welded gusset on the front of this fork where the front tire mounts if you spin that around backwards it moves that front tire back maybe an inch and a half in a lot of ways so what but that changes the balance of the bicycle it moves that front wheel a couple inches back and this little kid's bike has these great big disc brakes so the kids 
trucking along, trucking along. You've got that fork on there backwards. He tags that front brake, just pulls it really hard and gets launched right over the handlebars. Um, so it, it changes the balance of the bicycle. Um, I was kind of hoping to have uh, a video showing this, but all the bicycles that I own, it's actually impossible to put the fork on backwards. Um, I took that old green bike and um, tried to put the fork on backwards and everything stops it. There's a reflector tab that stops it from being put on backwards. The fender stops it from being put on backwards. But you can see the curve of the fork as I've got it almost turned around backwards here in this photo. That's what I'm talking about. A lot of front forks have, now this one is an extreme curve. You couldn't possibly mistake that this is supposed to face inward. But a lot of forks have a little bit of push that moves that front wheel out a little bit. And remember, any time the fork curves or it's got gussets and it moves the, the wheel away from the fork, that's supposed to be forward. Anytime there's a brake mounted on the front fork, that's supposed to be on the outside of the fork. A um, little bit of a common mistake. If, if you go to pull that bike out of a box, brand new, look at that front fork, look at the pictures of the bike, and make sure that you have it looking exactly like the photograph. Um, and look at the photograph. Sometimes the drawings they put in the uh, assembly instructions are terrible. Um, very often the wording in assembly instructions is just, um, it's literal translation, so it's gobbledygook and makes no sense. So just be careful and check that front fork and make sure it's put on the, the right way. Another question. How old should a kid be before they start working on bikes? I often get such subjective questions. Um, this is one, it, it's, it's, it depends on the kid. Is the kid really mechanically inclined? Who knows? Here's a picture of me at 11 years old, uh, pulling a wheelie on my um, BMX bike. My brother and I had just replaced the front fork on this bicycle and um, I purchased a bunch of pads, actually safety pads. You can see I've got no helmet, but I'm, I'm, I'm worried about those safety pads. Um, so I was 11. My brother would have been 14, 15. And we were, well, first of all, we had uh, destroyed the front fork on this bicycle, jumping it and doing silly things like that, and purchased a new fork and installed it. And um, I had been working on my own bicycles for probably a couple years at this point. Um, but it, it all depends on the kid. I can tell you when I first started working on bikes, I used vice grips or whatever I could. And uh, that's something you never want to do. Um, here's a picture of vice grips on a bolt. Don't use vice grips on anything. Um, if you've got a, a stripped fastener that you're going to remove and throw out, then it's okay to use vice grips. Uh, but don't use vice grips on anything you plan to save. Uh, they're kind of an emergency, last-ditch effort tool. But one thing, any kid doing anything, especially for the first time, they need adult supervision. And you need to make sure that the adult knows what they're doing and is instructing the kid properly. And maybe the kid helps instead of doing it on their own. But this is such a subjective thing. Um, some kids are going to get mechanical things straight away. Some kids, just it, it just isn't going to make sense to them. And they're going to get frustrated and, and want to give up. So adult supervision and see if the kid's enjoying it, if they're getting the concepts of tightening fasteners properly, using the proper size wrench, et cetera. Um, and any age where they show the interest and have the, the ability. So that, that could be anything um, from, from a very small child up to maybe the kid just never wants to work on a bicycle.
So I'm, I'm, I'm now asked, what projects are you working on now? Well, this is actually a project that I started a long time ago. Here's me when I was 18 years old and I had built a custom made tandem bicycle. I had actually taken a couple of old Schwinn frames that I found on a farm and cut them and welded them together to make this tandem bike and rode this bike for many, many years. And uh, it got kind of put off to the side and neglected and now it, it needs to be rebuilt. And so this is one that I'm hoping to get done uh, this season. I want to rebuild this bike. I'm going to change a few things, modernize a few things on it. And hopefully I will get this uh, down from the garage ceiling and rebuilt and up and running, uh, hopefully early summer. Well, I want to thank you for joining us. And if you have any questions that I haven't answered, please visit your library. If you're like me, I'm the kind of person who, since I was a kid, if I had a question that I couldn't answer, we didn't have the internet when I was a kid. Um, I loved the reference desk at the library. Um, walking up and asking any question, sometimes really odd questions that you wouldn't think of asking a reference librarian, they can get you the answers. They can get you the materials you need to learn just about anything. Um, so go to your local library, ask questions, ask for the materials you need to, to learn how to do anything you want to learn how to do. Your, your library is a, an amazing resource and you can learn literally anything you want to learn by visiting your local library. Thank you again and have a safe and enjoyable writing season. Bye-bye.